I am absolutely thrilled to be moderating this conversation for two reasons. Firstly, as an anthropologist, um, some of you may earlier have heard me talk about my new book, Anthrovision, this one here. Um, I'm fascinated by the really fundamental changes that are going on right now in terms of how we see money, and also by the fact that there's really nothing new in t under the sun, and some of this is actually going back to the future rather than being quite so forward-looking. But as a journalist, I am thrilled to talk about cryptocurrency because for us at the Financial Times, crypto is a bit like the Kim Kardashian of the financial journalism world. <laughs> it's a story that we know if we put it on the front page, we will get everyone reading, loads of clicks, and really, really strong passions because some people absolutely love it, some people absolutely hate it. And in just the last few weeks looking back at the headlines, we've had a whole series of best of times and worst of times stories about cryptocurrencies. Worst of times, China's clamped down on the Bitcoin miners, sending the price crashing. We've had the UK and Japanese in just the last couple of days clamp down on Binance, or Binance, I don't know how you pronounce that. We've had people like Warren Buffett say he thinks the whole thing is pointless. I think he was talking about Bitcoin. We've had outflows, apparently, from Ethereum funds, and we've had wild price volatility, partly sparked by people like Elon Musk complaining about the environmental impact of all this. What took him so long to notice, one might ask. On the best of times, though, we've also had um, groups like Goldman Sachs, JP Morgan, Fidelity, lots of mainstream players jumping in. We've got Jim Cramer coming out just yesterday saying he loves Ethereum and wants to buy lots of it. And we've got, most importantly, the central banks themselves saying that they want to get involved in this through central bank digital currencies. So, Kim Kardashian of the financial world. Not, not, <laughs> not me. Um, let me quickly start, before I start asking you questions, by asking the audience, how many of you in the room own some kind of Bitcoin, Ethereum, or cryptocurrency? It's a okay. pretty good number. Pretty good number, yeah. yeah. Let age be no bar barrier. How many of you in the room think it's a really exciting, positive development? And how many of you think it's actually just a gigantic Ponzi scheme dreamt up to distract your kids? Okay, is it a Ponzi scheme? You've actually got more supporters in the room than detractors. It's a Ponzi scheme to the extent that uh, the Federal Reserve notes are, are Ponzi schemes. Um, so it, uh, cryptocurrency is essentially uh, built on top of a new kind of database technology. It's a database technology that enables many different independent actors to all hold the data, inspect the data, um, and agree on exactly what happened and when it happened with respect to transactions on this globally shared ledger. And so what that does is it's basically an invention of digital scarcity. Uh, and so I can give Jillian an MP3 song, um, and I can give that same song to, to many people in the audience, and, and there is no real digital scarcity there. Um, but on this new kind of database, database technology, we can create digitally scarce assets. Uh, so it's uh, a new kind of trust foundation for the planet. We've lived for mil millennia uh, using subjective trust systems that are based on centralized institutions that imbue transactions and relationships with trust. Um, and we're living in a world where there is loss of trust in those centralized institutions and Things are very complicated. Technology is uh, very complex, uh, and it is possible to wield those centralized systems in ways that don't serve the general population. Uh, right. and so basically, you work through scarcity of asset, just like gold, yep. unlike fiat currency, and the trust is not vertical in that you're trusting into a central bank or an authority figure. You're trusting each other, yep. and you're trusting the computing technology. Yeah, so at the foundation of this new paradigm um, is horizontal trust. It's 
um, on Ethereum 1, it's around 8,000. Ethereum version 1.0, it's about 8,000 uh, validators uh, running the system right now. They share their resources and process transactions, and they get paid for that. Um, Bitcoin's about the same size in terms of number of validators. Ethereum 2 is already started, and we're at around 150,000 validators. Um, and the two are going to merge soon. I'm, I'm sure we'll, we'll right. be able to talk about that. Uh, but essentially, um, this base layer is a new trust foundation for the planet. It enables us to build systems going forward um, with automated and objective trust rather than the subjective trust that we've built on forever. I'm going to ask you in a minute just to quickly define the difference briefly between Bitcoin and Ethereum or Dogecoin or the other coins out there. Apparently someone's dreaming up hamster coin right now. But um, before I do that, though, I'd like to ask you, um, in terms of why people should trust anybody else on the internet or trust the computing system, what do you say to people who say, how do we manage to trust that at all? Because it seems to me one of the problems with cryptocurrencies is that to understand it, you have to have knowledge of three things which are almost never taught together. You need to understand economics, you need to understand cryptography and computer science, and you need to understand game theory. Because game theory appears to underpin essentially the trust. Sure. And I don't know if anyone in the room's got a training in all three of those, but I certainly don't. So tell us why we should trust any part of this system. So with, with any complicated technology like automotive technology, pharmaceutical technology, they're always experts and they have their own tribality and they, they have their own um, um, vocabulary. Uh, and uh, in the global financial system, um, there is also the, the same sort of situation. And uh, the difference between the current global financial system and the proposed decentralized financial system uh, that is being built right now on this new trust layer uh, is that the current global financial system is largely built um, in closed source software, um, in back rooms. Um, it's basically uh, a, a bunch of siloed systems um, and effectively a, a private infrastructure. Um, and some of it is, is made public, certainly. But in the, in the open, open source, decentralized financial system that's being built, everything is open. It's all open source. There are uh, hordes of very smart people who understand uh, those technologies who are constantly pouring over these systems and making them better and fixing bugs when they arise. It's essentially like what um, the web technology and the internet technology did for access to information around the world and the ability to publish information, the ability to engage in or build e-commerce or social networking. It's the democratization of finance. Um, and so um, the, the world of creators, the world of entrepreneurs are, are now focused on building decentralized finance, which will be very fluid and, and global. So how, because you're, you're second after Bitcoin, that's how it's usually seen. I'm sure you regard in, yourself in as first. In only one measure. What? In only one measure. What, what measure? Two measures. First, Bitcoin came first. Right. And second, they had the largest, it has the largest monetary base. Um, but I'd be happy to explain the difference when you're ready. Okay. Well, tell us, um, tell us briefly, because I've got so much I want to cover, but tell us briefly sure. how Ethereum is different from Bitcoin or Dogecoin. Doge. Doge. Sorry, Dogecoin. Yeah. As I said, I'm on a learning journey so, too. That's so. how Elon prefers to Okay, Dogecoin, as um, said by Elon so, Musk. So Bitcoin was invented uh, ba based on a couple of decades of explorations, really. It was invented or released into the world in 2008, start of 2009. Um, and it was essentially um, this new trust foundation applied to a very narrow use case, uh, the issuance of a token. Um, that was intended to represent money. Um, in my opinion, uh, the nomenclature cryptocurrency uh, has caused the industry to suffer very much because it's not a good currency in many, in, in a couple of respects uh, of currency. It is a good growing store of value. And so I like to think about it uh, as basically an NFT, the, a, a big, incredibly valuable, conceptual, non-fungible token. Um, 
and it is fractionated uh, so that many people in the world can own uh, this concept, uh, essentially. Uh, and like a valuable piece of art, um, it will potentially grow in value. And it's very similar to gold in that respect, where gold is fractionated and many people in the world own uh, some gold and, and treat it as, uh, as a store of value. Uh, so very narrow financial use case. Um, and that it's been easy to explain uh, to early adopters and financial institutions, it's a store of value. Ethereum is the next generation or a foundation for the next generation decentralized web. Uh, you can build any sort of application, including many applications in decentralized finance on it. And so um, the ecosystem of Ethereum developers is enormous. It's much larger than any other ecosystem uh, in the cryptocurrency space. And, and Bitcoin has a, a very small ecosystem of developers. Well, some people would say, um, and I think with some reason, that you know, Bitcoin may end up looking like the MySpace of the social media world, and you are aspiring to be the Facebook which, you know, is not we always... We are not a aspiring to be the face. <laughs> <laughs> I meant in terms of market positioning. I'm sure you don't want to be we're, associated we're with... We're aspiring to be the next, the foundation of the decentralized web. So are you trying to be the Google of crypto cryptocurrencies? Is that what consensus is? Google is built on the web, and we're aspiring to be... Ethereum is aspiring to be the foundation of the decentralized web. It's a, a platform for running applications. So you're aspiring to be, in a sense, a Google plus Amazon Web Services plus... The one, one way to think of Ethereum is as a global, open, super app... Uh, so the same way that uh, there, there are certain super apps, especially in China, where you can do all the things that you want to do, um, rent a car, uh, pay your bills, etc. cetera. Um, what's happening right now is that on this permissionless platform, uh, many people around the world, many companies around the world are, are building applications. And unlike um, building applications and in, in delivering th them through the Apple Store, the Google Play Store, um, or on Facebook or on LinkedIn even, um, there's virtually no platform risk. Um, right. Apple isn't gonna, or Ethereum can't bump people's applications off the network. And uh, in my opinion, reducing platform risk on the planet is, uh, is a very important thing to do right now because uh, uh, platform power is wielded um, in concerning ways. So you present yourself as a decentralized system that cannot be controlled by any one government or any one tech giant, is that fair? Um, so there are ways of attacking the system and, and reducing the interest in building out the system or using the system if you're a very well-resourced actor um, and you decide that you don't want um, that system to have impact on your nation state, China, for instance, uh, potentially, um, you can forbid it. You can make it illegal. So China uh, can you, bring you, you can, down? No, China can bring Ethereum down inside of China. Uh, China and, and in order to do that, uh, they kind of have to shut down the internet there or, or drastically reduce the functionality of certain aspects of the internet. Um, so you could do that in America, but you'd have to really shut down the internet and you'd have to suspend free speech. Um, and so I'm not worried that that's going to happen. Well, that's a debate point at some point. <laughs> Currently, I'm not worried. Okay. Well, we can go that another time. But, um, but just to quickly um, pick on this point, though, about decentralization, because one of the really important things that's happening right now to you is you're going from crypto 1.0 to 2.0 in terms of having a system where... So Ethereum 1.0 if, well, to, to yeah. 2.0? Yeah. In that you're going from proof of, proof of work to yeah. proof of stake. And proof of work is the, the very energy consumptive version. Um, Can you just very briefly, because I mean, we're dealing with an audience that's probably both kindergarten and PhD yeah. here today. <laughs> Um, I, I'm about sort of grade two right now, second grade. Um, but you're going from a system where people actually own the currency and create the currency by mining it through intensive energy consumption and computer systems into one where they just have to use the computers to prove they own a piece. Is that right? Yeah, well said. Um, so backing up a little bit, uh, um, we have built uh, the early stages of a new trust foundation for the planet. Uh, the trust characteristic derives from massive decentralization. If you can get hundreds of thousands of independent actors 
running nodes on the network and validating transactions on the network, um, then it is enormously difficult to cheat the system, basically. So you have to get to all the different actors uh, if you want to change a historic entry in, in this database. Um, what Bitcoin's, one of Bitcoin's central inventions was to uh, require miners um, to do lots of computations to solve a puzzle, to have the right to propose um, the next state of the system, to basically package up a whole bunch of transactions in a block and link that block to the history of blocks. And as the history gets deeper and deeper, it becomes virtually impossible to change or repudiate the history of, of the system. Um, Unfortunately, it, it has turned into a hardware and energy arms race. Uh, and in order to mine a Bitcoin block, um, the world is burning a lot of electricity. In order to mine an Ethereum block, the world is burning a bunch of electricity, not, not nearly as much as, as for Bitcoin. Um, we have worked from the start of the Ethereum project on something called proof of stake, which replaces uh, the specialized hardware uh, and the uh, consumptive nature, uh, the energy consumptive nature of the system uh, with essentially an economic bond. Uh, so you take some ether, you put it in a program on the Ethereum network, and then you are probabilistically selected to uh, process the next block. And, and there's a lot of randomness in there so that you don't, out of 150,000 validators, you don't know when you're going to be selected and there's redundancy in selection. But basically, um, it is a much more decentralized system. It is much fairer because there are no efficiencies of scale. Uh, I can run one validator, and if you're running 10,000 in, in your warehouse, you don't have any um, uh, right. non-linear uh, advantage. Um, and uh, it's a system that uh, has low barrier to entry. Uh, so anyone can, can participate in it, and um, it 99.999 something percent uh, more energy efficient. What about the criminal aspect of it, which often is seen as being one of the reasons why regulators might want to shut it down? I, does it worry you that criminals might be using this, that people can use it for ransomware and things like that? Or is that, you'd say that's just Bitcoin? Yeah, so ransomware is an unfortunate problem, um, but there have been ransoms uh, and kidnapping and um, setting up uh, companies to receive ransom payments for a long time. Um, so um, the US dollar is used in, in lots of criminal activities. Um, and any new technology can be used on the fringes for, for some nefarious acts, uh, but um, this is a revolution in how we build trust systems and financial systems, and many systems architected on top of those things, and so we should not throw the baby out with the bathwater. Right. Well, before I go to, I think we have time for a few questions in just a moment. Before I do, though, what about central banks? Because, you know, I've spent a lot of time talking to central banks in the last couple of years about this, and they've moved from a position of absolute horror um, and scorn. Yeah to very suddenly, in the last two or three weeks, the, what I call the Basel tribe, the group of central bank governors around the, and the, the BIS at, in Basel, have suddenly, um, I wouldn't say come behind it, but indicated that they're not only running their own innovation centers, but they are planning, in some cases, to issue central bank digital currencies, mm -hmm. which are not the same as Bitcoin, but they're moving into this space. So two questions, are you worried that they're basically going to displace you and disintermediate you? Because if the Fed were to issue a digital currency, how on earth would you possibly compete with that? And are you in any way seeing a potential to try and collaborate with them instead and for those you know, dusty old central bank governors to start working with the cool kids on the block like you? <laughs> um. So we've worked um, with the Monetary Authority of Singapore, with the South African Reserve Bank. Currently, we're work working with the Hong Kong Monetary Authority, Bank of Thailand. Uh, PBOC is um, in the mix on our, a regional experiment. The BIS is overseeing a, a lot of that work. Um, 
So we are very happy to facilitate the, the use of the technology uh, for those kinds of institutions. Uh, we've had talks with the, with the Fed. Um, it, it'll be interesting how um, these systems are rolled out. So China's currently um, ahead of the pack. Um, I'm not so worried about China rolling out their digital currency system early. Um, part of their interest is similar to the, the One Belt, One Road initiative where they um, entice partners to, to get into their system. Um, but ultimately, the rule of law is gonna win in this situation and the United States is, is gonna be just fine from a, a reserve currency perspective. Um, the United States has, um, has a project going on and very recently, uh, Randall Quarles, who I think he's the chairman of the- uh, He's in charge of the, um, FSB, the financial, yeah, financial yeah. stability board and he's a, a board member at the Fed. Um, he indicated that he wasn't concerned about stable coins. So stable coins are um, a monetary construct on Ethereum uh, that basically either represents a digital asset in a bank, one, one to one um, to, to the dollar, um, or there are mechanisms where they're, uh, they have, they're over collateralized in different ways. And, uh, so it's nice. So that's, that's a cryptocurrency that, that is a, a stable um, unit uh, of account, uh, which is really valuable. Um, he indicated essentially that, hey, we shouldn't be worried about um, these stable coins. Uh, private organizations have been issuing money um, since the, the start of the Federal Reserve. That's how money gets created. Uh, it's, uh, private commercial banks are, are essentially uh, given permission based on reserve ratios to, right. to issue new money into the world. And so um, there doesn't seem to be a philosophical uh, concern about uh, having these systems out in the world. Um, and if some of them are competitive, if some, if some of them have um, different capabilities, uh, then that's just, that's just choice, that's optionality. And, well, and, uh, I suspect uh, there may we, not be a philosoph philosophical problem, there may be a political and power problem, because I don't think anywhere in history a group of elites who control things have said, yes, sure. we're dying to give power to the crowd. Sure, so, but this technology, um, is very aligned with free market capitalism. Um, it's very aligned with liberal democratic philosophy. Uh, and so at its base, it is a very free market capitalistic. Um, and you can also create these governance systems uh, that are basically collectives and they can um, issue their own currency uh, and um, make proposals and enact proposals according to whatever philosophy um, right. they, they prefer. And so you can have a socialist looking collective or, or, or any um, color on the spectrum. Right, a socialist, a socialist uh, Ethereum coin, that'll be interesting. Um, we have time, I think, for literally for one question, maybe two, um, if anyone's got a question they'd like to ask. If not, I would like to ask about Elon Musk. Oh. Is he a friend or foe? Uh, I've never met him. Um, I think he's a brilliant individual doing great things for humanity. Um, and unfortunately, he tends to use his platform sometimes in perhaps slightly irresponsible ways. And so um, I think he should um, be much more careful about things he says because they, they can have real impact on people's lives. And two other quick questions. I've got barely any time. Do you own any fiat currency? I own With a, all your money in Ethereum I, I these days, a, or all your so, assets? So there's a few dollars in, in my wallet, um, <laughs> and, and a couple of credit cards, uh, and I, I have a, a little bit of money in the bank, yeah. Right. And I guess the other question I'm curious about is, so much of your um, excitement about this is based on an assumption that fiat currencies are going to die. You often talk about- I didn't about, say that. Or, 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 I never or, said that. Okay, well, where do you see fiat currencies going? Well, for as long as- In uh, a minute. People live near one another, we're gonna need governance, and, and governments are good at governance, uh, and governments should, of course, issue their own tokens. Uh, so, um, the technology that has been used by nation states to issue currency has evolved, or tribes to issue money uh, has evolved for a long time. Shells and 
notches on sticks and beads and pieces of paper and rounds of metal and entries in centralized databases. And so we have a, a better database technology. And of, of course, nation states are going to use that. Well, thank you. Well, that's been very interesting. I've certainly learned a lot by listening to you. I hope you and the audience have too. Can I just quickly ask one last question? Based on what you've just heard, does anyone now feel more confident about investing in cryptocurrencies and Ethereum than before? You did a well, good job. Well, I think you're the salesman here. <laughs> anyway, thank I, you very I'm much. Kim Kardashian, <laughs> the Kim Kardashian. The Kim Kardashian.